plenty of space over there. We'll call to order tonight's Committee of the Whole for the Auburn City Council meeting for December the 20th, 2022. Certainly want to welcome everybody that's with us here tonight. Welcome those that are listening uh, or watching. We're glad to have you. City Council should have the minutes from the Committee of the Whole from December the 6th, 2022. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? If not, is there a move to approve? So moved. Second. I have a motion is second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the minutes are carried forth. Board of Education, Mayor Pro Tem Witten. Yes, sir. We have one vacancy. Unexpired term begins immediately and ends May 31, 2026. Um, Dr. Terry Jenkins resigned, and I would like to say that we definitely um, valued his time on the um, Board of Education, and we will miss him, but we know that he will um, still be in our area, and um, we appreciate his time of service. We did hold um, interviews. We had five candidates that interviewed, and I think all five were um, great interviews and like to appreciate and say thank you to their time. But I would like to um, make a nomination for Blake Prestige. I have a nomination for Blake Prestige. I have a second. 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 I have a nomination and a second for Blake Prestige. Are there any other nominations? Yes, yes Mr. Mayor, I'd like to nominate Dr. Florence Holland. All right. I have a motion for Florence Holland. Do we have a second? Second. Nomination from Florence Holland. Any other nominations? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to nominate Charles Israel. Charles Israel. Is there a second from Mr. Israel? Second. All right. We have a motion and a second from Mr. Israel. Okay. This time we'll open up for discussions. Um, any discussion, we'll take these one by one. So any discussion or comments from Mr. Blake Prestridge? Well, I'll start. I think um, that Blake has demonstrated a commitment to community, especially through his interview process. He demonstrated um, how he would serve the community and be involved at multiple levels, not just attending the meetings. And I think his um, financial background would serve the Board of Education strongly, especially with the um, growth that they're experiencing and the capital projects that they have coming up. Anyone else like to speak for Mr. Prestridge? Uh, yes, yes. Sure. I, I, first off, I'd like to thank uh, all the applicants that uh, uh, applied and expressed a willingness to serve. Uh, each and every one of you brought a different perspective and a diverse and unique set of skills. Uh, however, I do believe that Blake's skill set and temperament uh, is uh, especially suited uh, uh, for the board uh, during this season of... of um, growth and transition that the Auburn City School System is entering into. Um, I believe that Blake's financial expertise and his uh, uh, civic involvement will be invaluable. I believe that he'll make decisions based on the best interest of our children. I believe that he'll support our teachers and that uh, uh, he'll also empower our parents because he um, he understands and he respects their fundamental rights to make decisions based off the uh, regarding the, their children's upbringing and care. And I think that Blake, uh, Blake would be the best candidate for uh, this seat. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for Mr. Prestridge? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, too, would like just to echo the uh, Tyler and Beth's comments. Uh, we, we had a great pool of applicants that applied and we're thankful to, to everyone that uh, that showed up in interview. It was, a, it was a great process. Just echoing a little bit uh, of, of Blake's community involvement, he, he's already demonstrated that in some of his uh, involvement in our community. And I think it's important to have uh, board education members that are present in our community uh, so that our community members can build relationships uh, with, with these folks uh, as they're making very important decisions uh, about our school system here. And uh, so I think Blake has demonstrated that and, and would be a great great candidate and um, also uh, echoing the financial background that he brings uh, he helps uh, folks take care of their money uh, reach financial goals and with the, the upcoming uh, high school I think that's going to be a, uh, a tremendous project uh, not only from a construction standpoint but from a financial standpoint and I think he would bring a great expertise uh, in, in that project so I look forward to supporting him tonight Anyone else? 
Okay. Well, I'll also be supporting Mr. Prestridge tonight. Um, I thought he did an excellent job during his interview. He gave very thoughtful uh, answers to his questions. He has been a proven commodity in our community as far as being involved in our community. Um, again, I think the financial uh, understanding uh, and assisting the school board as they make million dollar decisions uh, here in the near future will be very beneficial to Dr. Herring and her staff. Um, I do think that we had an excellent pool of candidates. I want to thank all eight people that applied to be on the school board and certainly the five individuals from our community who sat in front of us and went through the interview process. I appreciate every one of them being willing to do that. Okay. All right. Dr. Holland, uh, Mr. Parsons, I believe you made the nomination. Would you like yes, to speak Mr. for Mayor. Yes, um, it's no secret that I've supported Dr. Holland on the uh, number of times that she has applied and been a finalist for the Board of Education. Uh, her replacing an outgoing educator, I think, is, a, is a, an appropriate uh, match um, in this time. I really uh, was quite impressed with Dr. Holland's interview last week, where she uh, spoke specifically about inclusivity and um, on a policy level, uh, finding results citywide for our students uh, with a particular focus on uh, sections of the demographics that are struggling harder than others. I thought it was a very incisive point that she brought. And while I understand that one, one uh, board member alone cannot necessarily affect a lot of change on that level, I thought her points even being heard uh, help to guide um, decision makers uh, particularly on the on the issue of inclusivity and uh, a fair shot for all of our students in the in the city and that certainly resonated for me uh, she brings a, a, a unique fresh perspective to to uh, the conversation and and I look forward to supporting her and likewise uh, echoing what uh, other members here have said we had an outstanding group of candidates and I appreciate all of them who were willing to put themselves out there in, in this way. Mr. Parsons. Ms. Taylor. Okay, uh, I too would like to uh, nominate Dr. Holland. And um, I, I actually, when I, I listened at the other interviews, I wasn't present for the other interviews, but I did uh, look at the videos and, and all of them was pretty good candidates and everything. But Dr. Holland stood out to me the most uh, as Bob said, you know, uh, she talked a lot about being inclusive and she talked about diversity and how important it is in our school system. And she gave some uh, numbers as to, you know, um, some of the um, disadvantages uh, with our more diverse group of children. And um, she also, and, and I think the thing that really, really impressed me about her was <coughs> When, we, uh, when the question was asked, what would be one of her biggest challenges? And she spoke out and she said, before she would answer that question, she actually asked her son. And, and, and just to know that he gave some type of input for her decision as to why she would like to be on the board was pre pretty impressive. So, um, uh, so I, I just think that she would be uh, dedicated and I think that she would also be um, beneficial, beneficial to the board. So my one of the choices, like I said, all of the candidates did really, really good. But uh, my first choice would be Dr. Harlan. Yeah, good. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Okay, and now we'll move forward, Mr. Israel. Sonny. Well, as everybody has said, it was a it was a wonderful field of applicants who are blessed in this community to have that kind of interest in the school board. And I could be happy with any of them, quite frankly. Um, Dr. Charles Israel, of course, has a wide and a solid background uh, in leadership um, at Auburn University as associate dean, as department head. Um, he has um, 
made decisions, I believe, <clears throat> to show that he has a tremendous devotion to the uh, Auburn City School System. He has children there, like many of the other applicants. And I believe he will make decisions based on what's best for our students. So uh, with his wide range of experiences and leadership uh, in his background, I firmly nominate Dr. Charles Israel. Thank you. Mr. Griswold? Yeah, Ron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I was skipped there just for a second, but I would also like to express my support for Dr. Holland. Uh, the thing I think I admire most about her is her persistence. This is the third or fourth time that she has applied for this job and it's a difficult process. Um, I've consistently been in her corner on the previous uh, nominations and uh, selections for board members. And uh, I have to have to admit, she's, she's a tough cookie. She's, uh, she's hanging in there, and, and her, her interview was exceptional. So I, I uh, put my support behind Dr. Holland. Thank you, Mr. Griswold. Okay, anyone else have anything they'd like to say? Okay. Ms. Crouch, would, should we do this with the hand vote? Is that you the best way to do that? You do one at a time, and the, it's do the one first time. one to five. If you don't get five on any one of the candidates, we'll have to circle back around. Okay, so we'll do this. So I'll ask you to please raise your hand. So uh, all in favor of Mr. Blake Prestridge, please raise your hand. Hold on just a second because Lindsay needs to. Okay, and that's five. All right, we'll confirm that later on in the agenda. Again, I want to thank everybody for participating. Thank you for putting yourself out there to apply for this and to go through the interviews. We're very grateful, very honored that our community would draw such an excellent group of candidates. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Jenkins again for all of his great service to our community for years and years and years. He's been a great, great ambassador of everything great about Auburn and our children and our education. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. All right, Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Mayor Pro Tem Witten. Yes, sir. We have one vacancy. Term begins immediately, ends November 30, 2026. Incumbent Stacy Giles <clears throat> has served one full term, and I would like to nominate Stacy Giles for a second full term. Second. All right, I have a nomination and a second for Stacy Giles. Any other nominations? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And we'll confirm Ms. Giles later on in the agenda. Appreciate her willingness to serve. All right. Business License Ordinance Amendment Presentation. City Manager Crouch. All right, good evening, Council. Um, after we started this process, uh, before this Council was seated um, in the second meeting in October, uh, unanimous consent was denied, and then we moved on into November, and we've postponed a few times. So uh, the goal of tonight is there seems to be a lot of misinformation out there, and I would like to clarify a number of questions we've received. And so we're going to go over, you know, why did staff propose we make a change? You know, Allison Edge, our finance director, is going to give an, a general overview what our purpose and mission is, what we're trying to do as a staff. Um, Latrice Mose, who's our revenue manager, is going to talk about our tax collection process, and then I'll bring it full circle in the end. I think, though, the one most important thing that we can say is businesses, along with our citizens, are the lifeblood of our community. And there would never be an attempt by the city staff, never, to harm business in any way, shape, or form. Um, we have different, sometimes our goals are different. Sometimes we need to do things, and one of the number one things we're trying to do here is be sure that we're being equitable in the treatment of all businesses, and when the vast majority are paying their taxes and paying them relatively on time and doing what they're supposed to be doing, a business license is a privilege, not a right. And while we're really, really appreciative of all that businesses do, um, Fortunately or unfortunately, behind the scenes, the staff is the one that is left to enforce an ordinance. Every ordinance that is adopted by the city council, whether it be short-term rentals, whether it be um, zoning ordinance, whatever it is, the staff is left to implement and enforce. And so sometimes we get a little short in our ability to enforce certain aspects of ordinances without additional assistance. So um, certainly what we're trying to do here is a proposal to put all of the authority to, for the final enforcement actions in the elected governing body's hands, which is you, the nine elected member body by the citizens of Auburn. And what we're asking for is um, the 90 other cities that have this have it and it's in their governing body's hands. And I'm 
I'm a big proponent of the elected officials who are responsible to the citizens of Auburn having the final authority on things. You have very limited powers in the state of Alabama, and this is one of the few that you're afforded. Um, and so uh, we're going to go through. Please ask questions. This whole presentation is predicated on questions that we've gotten. Um, but I think there's also a tremendous amount of misinformation out there, and there's a lot of, of examples, and, and it's been pointed out that the city manager is going to tell you why that's a ridiculous example of something. Well, if somebody is already pointing that out to you in an email that it's a ridiculous example, it's because it is. And what I mean is if somebody doesn't pick up the garbage in front of their business, we're not going to close them down. That is not, not our mission and purpose in life. We work with people. This is, um, if somebody is running a sex trafficking operation out of their business, you don't have the ability to shut them down. The police can go after them for criminal things, but the city council has no authority. And that business can remain in operation. You have no authority to deal with that. Th these are the kinds of things that we're getting at in the rare circumstance it might be needed. So Allison's going to talk about the financial side, and we'll jump into the police power side at the end. Megan, okay. before we get started, just procedurally for the council, do you want us to stop and ask questions during yes, the presentation please. or wait to the end? This is, please get your questions out. We've met with some of you, talked with others, met with a lot of citizens about this, and this is predicated on the questions we've got, just like the frequently asked questions in your packets are all predicated on meetings that we've had and questions we've received. So, um, but also the one other thing is I want you to be very clear in any of these operations, our finance staff has to do certain things has to go through a lengthy process. It has to get to me, and then I have to agree to put it on an agenda where you, th you then would have to agree to have a hearing. Like, this is a long process, and for it to get to me, I'd like to remain employed, and I would not put something on the agenda that I didn't think belonged there. Allison. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to present some information about the amendment, and um, hopefully we can clarify some things about the amendment to Section 12 of the City Code. I'll cover a couple of general things, and then Latrice Mose, who has been our revenue manager for over 17 years, will go through uh, a collection process example with you so that you can see what we do uh, in a, in, on the um, failure to pay side of that. So how did we get here? Uh, discussions about revocation, uh, a revocation provision have been happening for many, many years. I have been at the city for 23 years, and I have been not always directly involved in those conversations, but each time there is an issue with a business, whether it's a health, safety, welfare issue or whether it is a failure to pay issue, the question comes up, why can't we just shut them down? We get that question. We ask it, we get it from public safety. We've actually gotten it from citizens in the past if there's anything going on with a business. A lot of times they know some things we don't, so we get that question a lot. Uh, we also get, why don't you just not renew their business license? If they're doing something like not paying, why don't we just not renew? And in some cases, we don't renew, but it still doesn't, we still do not have the ability, you do not have the ability to close the business even if they don't, do not have a, a valid license at the time. And those are very legitimate questions. And as we have worked throughout the years with the city attorney to discuss that and, and try to figure out what, it, what is the best way for this to happen, we have generated some of our own questions that we ask throughout that process. Some of those are, why is the governing body, the body that actually uh, grants the business license, not able to revoke under certain circumstances? <clears throat> why do we think that sending our business owners off to district court is the most efficient way to do that? It's very costly for them. They are likely going to hire an attorney in that situation. And it is also costly for the city. Why wouldn't we want our governing body, the people who know our businesses the, the best, they know our business community, they know our city, to make decisions like that as opposed to another, like a court, who may not know our community and understand our business processes? Why wouldn't we want the most efficient process that doesn't drag on and on and businesses are going through a can be sometimes several years long process to get to where we need to be with that. So those are some of the things that we think through from a staff perspective. So as we have worked over the years to answer those questions, we are constantly reminded um, by attorneys that most other municipal business license ordinances in the state have provisions that deal with these type of issues. Now, I want to be very clear about that. Just because they have it doesn't mean we have to, and that should not be the reason for us to have to, but it is certainly supporting information on where we came up with this language. We did not just make things up. This language is not unusual. 
It is not unreasonable. And if it were, it would not be so uniform across the state. That's that language that is used. One of the things that the attorney also reminds us of is that Alabama courts have long and consistently held that a license is a privilege extended by a municipal governing body and that that governing body can revoke the same as long as it is not arbitrary or capricious. And that's very important in that. And that the taxpayer has due process. The last time that we uh, had any meaningful conversation about this type of provision was in late 2019, early 2020. I became finance director in September of 2019. And one of, as I started meeting with staff in my new role, one of the very first things that Latrice talked to me about was the discussions that have been had over time about this issue. And so we started talking again about what that might look like. Well, then the pandemic hit, okay? And so as much as we, I'm very tired of using that excuse, that was a very important and devastating time for our businesses. And it was important that we put this on the back burner during that time. We pivoted at that time to help them get through that hard time. And we wanted to make sure that we gave them plenty of time to get back on their feet before we ever brought this up again. So now there has been a good amount of time since that happened. We feel like businesses have had time to recover. And here we are, and we're still having issues with some businesses as it relates to failure to pay their taxes. So the ordinance is being introduced now so that we can make that process reduce the amount of time that businesses are allowed to operate in violation of city code. That's what we want to do. Okay, I also want to take um, the next thing that's on the agenda. That was a little bit of the history. I wanted to take this opportunity to um, remind everyone what the finance department's responsibility is related to uh, enforcing, administering our business license ordinance. And part of that is in our mission, and I have it highlighted in blue on the slide. Administering the city's revenue ordinances and finance-related laws, regulations, and contracts in an efficient and equitable manner. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we are constantly looking at our processes, constantly looking at ordinances. Uh, one of the revenue manager's main task in her job description is to develop ordinances related to revenue law. And so that's something that she is always doing and looking at. And when problems do arise, we brainstorm to determine if there is something in our ordinance that is not efficient, is there something in our ordinance that does not um, treat everyone involved fairly, then we need to look at that. Also as part of that is that we operate under the city's core values, which I have listed as well. That the core values are values that were um, determined and set by employees. I was a part of that group that set those years ago, and one of those is fairness. So that revolves around providing services, administering municipal ordinances fairly, with absolutely no regard for personal opinion or belief. Now, I'm a citizen too, and I have a lot of opinions as a citizen. I don't always agree or disagree with things that come from this body. But my, in my capacity as finance director, the city of Auburn, its citizens, its businesses, our visitors, all the things that, that come together to make this place great, that is my, that is my role. That is the, the primary focus. We make decisions that are um, very thought through, based on fact. One of the things that this core value says is that it's based on accurate information. And for us, that is what we do every day. It's what we do, what we know, what we deal with in the daily operation of a revenue office in a municipality. And that is how we make decisions. We get that information honestly and we present it objectively with the city's best interest in mind and the city being everyone, citizens, business and all. And even if that recommendation is not popular, that is not, that is not our role with whether it's popular. It is what we feel as professionals is the best, is the best option for that. We think we, we want to treat businesses the same. The fairness issue is a very important thing for us, when it, particularly when it comes to failure to pay taxes. So the last thing I want to mention is fiscal responsibility. So every single city employee and all of you have a level of fiscal responsibility to our citizens and businesses. But I would venture out to say that the finance department, we better all be on board with fiscal responsibility. That is what we do every single day in every action that we take. It's important to me and I expect every person in that department to have the same 
thought about fiscal responsibility. Sales tax is our largest revenue source. It is 50% of the general fund budget. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't have a city. There would be nothing to talk about. So when a, a citizen or a visitor goes into a business and they pay a sales tax, and I'm one of those, they have an expectation that that money is being sent to where it should go. <clears throat> They are acting, that business is acting, and they agree when they get a business license that they are acting as an agent of the city of Auburn and that they get that sales tax where it needs to go. And so that, I, I really have a big problem, you know, with non-payment of something that didn't belong to you in the first place. You're acting as an agent. That should be coming to us. So as Latrice will tell you and just, you know, talk through with you that process, closing a business is never our goal. It is not, it is incredibly irresponsible for me to even think that closing <coughs> a business is a good option. But at the same time, I expect those obligations to be met. We want this to be as efficient and equitable as, as, as it can be. And we feel like that, that process of sending someone off to district court may not be the best option for our businesses. And so Latrice is actually going to come up and talk through that process. And I would imagine a lot of your questions will come from what she goes through. Thank you. Uh, I have to lower this just a tad. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask a question before she gets yeah. started, OK? OK, so this ordinance that we're uh, talking, uh, uh, trying to change tonight, it does, it's only pertaining to um, not paying your taxes, or is it pertaining to other violations, or just not paying taxes? Yeah, it, I mean, there are provisions in it for both. Um, one of the things that we see the most and, and generates the most questions comes from the failure to pay. Okay. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Good and evening. Like Allison said, I'm Latrice Mose, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about the process. What is the process? What do we do? when we have businesses that we've discovered that aren't paying their license fees or taxes. The revenue office generates a delinquent list and the staff goes over that list. We analyze it. We're looking for any business that just should not be on that list. So that's our very first step. So if once we're satisfied with that list, we send out a notice. And that notice is a notice of delinquency. Call it a reminder, because sometimes they just don't know that they've forgotten to pay the taxes or somebody else was supposed to pay the taxes. A majority of our issues are resolved with that initial notice. So we send that notice out. But for those that remain delinquent, staff does further analysis on those delinquent accounts and spend weeks going over there, narrowing it down to businesses to make sure that those businesses are still open, that we have the appropriate addresses to send information to. And then we send a, a second letter, and that letter is a little more aggressive than the first letter. So that's why we make sure we have all the information correct, because this second letter may include information about further legal action that we'll take. And from that Second letter, we get a little more traction. But still, we've got a large delinquency that we're working with here. So we narrow it down even further. And we look at just Auburn-based businesses, businesses that are brick and mortar, businesses that are here, that are still open, and that have large past due balances or <laughs> that just have been past due for a long time. And we make personal contact with those businesses then. We call them, we email them, we drive by, but we try to make some type of personal contact to see what's going on, what's happened, why haven't we received your taxes. And after we do that, we make arrangements with them from some, sometimes because maybe they can't pay, they can't catch up. So we talk to them about what can you do? How can we help you come into compliance? And again, we get traction from that and businesses come into compliance and we don't talk about them anymore. But then there are some that don't. So then what do we do? We have to cite those businesses to municipal court. And when they go to municipal court, now they have to explain to the judge why they're delinquent. 
Ms. Mose, can I stop yes. you right there? Yes. How much time in general, on average, yes. from from the first time you saw that they were delinquent mm -hmm. to they to they end up in court? How much? That could be three months. That mm -hmm. could be four months. We are working with people this entire time, and we've got a staff. We've got a small staff. They're doing other things during these months, so they're not just focusing on delinquencies. They're actually looking at um, key in taxes. They're processing payments. They're talking to taxpayer. We're making arrangements with them. Some of them ask, can I pay next month? Yes. Can I pay next week? And then we have to follow up to see if they um, did what they were going to do. So it could be three months before we first see them. You're fine. I'm and, sorry. Somebody's okay. <laughs> From the time we initially see them until um, we take them to municipal court. Or it could be five months. It just depends on the situation and how egregious that tax is. And how many communications would we have had with that? Before owner? we take them to municipal court, it is possible that we've had eight communications with them. And I'm just throwing out a number here because it's not just one, it's not two letters. We don't send two letters and then take you to municipal court. We've contacted you, we've worked with you, you've violated an agreement that you said you were gonna make with us. Okay. So. No, you asked okay. what I wanted okay. to ask. Okay. <laughs> and when we cite them to municipal court, a lot of times those businesses will pay. They'll pay before mm -hmm. municipal court because they don't want to go to municipal court. And we'll have them call the magistrate to see what can be done if they still have to show up to municipal court. We want to honor them in whatever way. Like Allison said before, our goal is not to embarrass businesses. Our goal is not to... Um, run them out of businesses we're here to help them we want you in compliance because we depend on your tax dollars to operate our city so whatever we can do to help we try to help but then we also have a fiduciary responsibility to collect those taxes so that's why we continue with our our processes with whatever legal means necessary to collect once we're in municipal court and those taxpayers still haven't paid. A lot of times they will ask the judge for leniency and ask if he can give them a payment plan and they'll come up with something that they can pay. The judge will honor them and set their cases for review. Again, we're talking another two months possibly. Whatever, you know, has to happen to get on the docket. Dockets don't, you know, the judge gives them time, number one, to pay their delinquencies. So when that happens, we're still talking now possibly eight months down the road where from the time where they haven't paid their taxes initially to the time when we're still trying to collect. And many of these businesses aren't keeping up. So we're not talking the initial tax that they were delinquent. We're talking the initial tax plus eight more months. So we're, we're piling on here. So they're, they're steadily bleeding. And... We get there and the taxpayer decides they don't want to keep those payment arrangements. And the judge then has to make a decision. There is an option for the judge to put them in jail. And many years ago, that option had been exercised. But we found when that happened, taxpayers still didn't pay. They were bond out of jail, but we didn't get any money. But the business is still operating. So it's still collecting taxes and there's nothing we could do. So at that point, staff would work with the city attorney's office to draft a resolution to ask the city council for permission to seek an injunction to close the business or seek whatever legal action necessary to collect the tax. We don't always close. That's the last result is up to and including closing a business, but we want to see eagle, any legal mean necessary to collect our taxes. There have been some businesses where we placed a lien on the property and we were able to collect our taxes when they sold the property, but not all businesses own property or own the property that their, their building is located in. We don't really want to be in the business of owning stoves and fryers and stuff like that. So we don't necessarily place a lien on the equipment in the office or in their building, unless it's something that we think we can get some money from. But 
for the most part, we asked the district judge to shut them down. We have to have a court date set. Then we have to go to court. So we're talking another three months, possibly. And I'm giving you examples from one that we actually took years ago. Um, I think it was 2012 was the last time we took one. But anyway, um, no, 13. Anyway, um, so when that happens, the judge will ask the defendant, what can you do? And then again, they get another opportunity to make a payment arrangement. And that happened. So they made another payment arrangement. They did not keep it. So we come back to court. Judge says, well, you didn't keep your arrangement. And he sent the high sheriff to padlock the doors. And that was how that one ended with no tax given to the city. What? So that, what? Uh -huh. But how much money do we, if when, when we take someone to court, uh -huh. what, what, what are our legal expenses? Like, like the city? District court? Yes. That particular one was about right at $6,000. Just so under six. If you're talking nine to ten years ago, mm -hmm. legal fees have gone up. But it depends on hours billed. I mean, it is a straight. Uh, I think the key is it's not in, within our retainer with the city attorney's office. So we pay by the hour mm -hmm. for all of that work, whatever it takes. And then that's also asking the business typically then has an attorney as yeah. well. I mean, so, that's an expense yeah. to them, but yeah. So there's a cost associated with, with, with taking them to court. Yes. Okay. There is a cost to us associated with taking them to court. And, and I don't know where it starts. Well, it didn't start from when we drafted the resolution, but mm -hmm. when they had to send a warrant to district court and sit down and write that, our hours started. Mm -hmm. But you, we also have staff hours. And there may be, in many situations, there'll be a cost and, yes. and no... Uh, no money received. Right? Exactly. No return on our investment, basically, except we stopped the bleeding of what happened. Mm -hmm. But we, we lost about $30,000 on that particular one, but we paid six to take them to court. So that, you know, it, it, he would have still been in business earning money, collecting taxes had we not done anything because he refused to pay. And my question is, how often does that happen? I mean, I, I hear you saying that last time it happened was in 2013. Yes. So, I mean, is it like, do it happen a lot? What happens a lot is we have a lot of delinquent accounts, mm -hmm. and we work with these people to get them caught up. When it comes to city council, when we bring a resolution to the city council, we've exhausted everything we could in-house. And... As far as how many we brought to city council in the last 10 years, maybe less than 15. And again, we've still got about a thousand accounts we haven't even touched. We're going after the most egregious accounts, the ones that are so far behind or, or the large tax dollar amounts that we need to collect. We have to narrow it down because we have a small staff and we can't get to everybody. And we're, we're here asking for help with this part of our processes to let it stop with the city council. We already have to bring it to you to make a decision anyway to allow us to go to district court. If it stopped here, then you get to make the decision a whole lot sooner. And we don't have an additional six, seven months no. of district court appearances where we have to allow them to stay open as we're making decisions and collect taxes and so forth so but just to be clear when you mm -hmm. say let it stop here you mean close the business down or, or whatever decision you make okay yes yes but bring it to you to make that you're going to get information anyway we're going to bring the resolution to city council like we've always done when we need it to Okay, so with that being said, so once the city council make a decision, just say that decision is to shut the business down, or that decision may be to allow them additional time, mm -hmm. and we and and um, it doesn't happen on our part like it didn't happen in court. Right. So does it come back to city council to make a decision, or it just if 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 
you know, and I don't know what the end of this is going to be at the end of the day, but if the city council do allow them to, for additional time mm -hmm. to pay, mm -hmm. and they don't, mm -hmm. so at that point, would it come back to city council? It depends on how you rule. So you get to set the terms of whatever it is, the, the terms we're going to close the business, we're going to give you two more months to pay, and you have to come back if you don't. I mean, that's, that's going to be in your ruling. How this works ultimately, if you were to adopt this, this ordinance amendment in second meeting in January, January 17th, how it would ultimately work is you – if you even agreed to a hearing, you have to agree to a hearing in one meeting and then hold a hearing in a separate meeting. Um, you then have time between that meeting and your next regularly scheduled meeting to rule. So you have time as a council to deliberate and decide and do all of those things. Um, we do have um, outside counsel here, Paul Clark, who also works at times in connection with our city attorney's office. And Paul actually happened to be the attorney on the last case we took to court. Um, and he can he can uh, correct me if I'm wrong about the council can set the terms. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so that will ultimately be up to you. And that's what been one of our big deals is to make sure that the council, who's accountable to the citizens, is making those decisions as opposed to the court. But that's certainly up to you either way. Are the legal fees incurred by the city, can they be tacked on to the taxes owed if, if the company were to magically pay at the end of this process or no? I, I don't see why, why Mr. not. Clark? I mean, From a legal perspective, the answer is yes. How that mechanically happens under the city's current retainer agreement, uh, we, that would take, I think, some processing to develop the steps necessary to isolate those particularized fees. Okay. I have a question for the city manager. Um, you said this is not covered under our various retainer agreements, that this potential action is not. That's covered. correct. This is I, not. Why would we exclude this from our retainer agreements if it's a potential legal action that we're there are things in our retainer agreements that, that are not covered any time we litigate. That's one of them. So city court is something, but uh, take short-term rentals. We're litigating about that. We have outside counsel, and we pay inside counsel, our city attorneys, by the hour for every bit of work that they've done for that. That's normal. The retainer is for our daily work. We drive our city attorney's office a little crazy. Probably most of my department heads in this room talk to somebody on our legal team once a day and then some of their staff members do and so on. We have a million and one questions um, about legal interpretation of things. That's what's covered in our retainer is daily work and advice for ordinances we're establishing. Like the establishment of this ordinance, that's part of our retainer, but if we have to litigate, it is not. Thank you. <clears throat> Megan, without those exclusions, would our, I would assume our retainer would be more expensive than it is? Is that we would have to figure right now. I just sat down with the city attorney. We're thirty plus thousand dollars out for last fiscal year. I mean, it's a it's a you roll the dice at the beginning of the fiscal year. So what I mean is, we got we're thirty thousand dollars to the good, and he's out thirty thousand dollars. If you actually build all the hours they spent on on our items, and that's fine. That that goes back and forth. We don't true up at the end. That's just cost of doing business. So, but we do pay. Um, there's a lot of things we've got work we do with Auburn University on things, with the Cleary Act. We've got all kinds of things that we do that that is outside of our retainer. And that, that is common and has been the way. I don't want to balloon our retainer, you know, $300,000 extra to cover what if. We keep the retainer as lean as possible, and then we pay for the what if separately. Just a couple of observations. Um, we avoid the cost of court with this kind of a ordinance. Um, we avoid time, so the additional taxes don't add up. And we uh, hopefully will come up with a fair decision that's presumed here. And never did I hear the word revocation. And it occurred to me that judges don't pull licenses um, they dole out jail time. They dole out um, fees or fines, I guess. 
but they don't pull licenses. So I don't think there is a mechanism in place through the court system to revoke a license. So is that true or not? It is true. Paul, you want to get to the microphone real mm -hmm. quick here? And So as part of the injunctive power of courts, they can enjoin the license. They can pull the license. Uh, typically, that does not happen. And I, I, it was only this afternoon that Latrice reminded me of that 2013 district court appearance in which we uh, took a local business to court. Uh, but we asked for a broad-based injunction in that particular matter, which would include shutting down the business, padlocking the business. And so had the, at any point in time during that litigation, the business owner complied with the uh, payment schedule that he agreed to uh, as part of the district court litigation at the very end of the process, then we would not have even sought that particular injunction to shut down the business. Is the um, option to revoke a license or enjoin a license <clears throat> only available at the district court or can that happen at the municipal court level? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Typically, we would not see a municipal court issuing broad-based injunctions. Uh, that's one of the reasons I believe that we went to district court at that period of time. That's correct. The Real quick, in 2007, I've talked about this, a lot of cities, including Opelika, passed this. There was a statewide business license reform act. We did not opt into it at that time because our then municipal judge believed we did have the authority for him to to revoke business licenses. And it turns out without this provision, we do not have that authority. And many years ago, the city did have the authority. So there was a 2007 statewide business license reform act of which Latrice also reminds me, we were one of the authors of that. And the reason we backed off on aspects of that at the time is we were advised that we had that authority and it turns out we do not. And that means we, the municipal judge does not have that authority. Typically, you would see the municipal court handle things like the criminal aspect of not paying uh, under an ordinance, which would include fines and or jail time. And again, that was not the direction we went in in 2013, because again, that does not produce the results that are uh, conducive to uh, collecting that amount. You put a person in jail, they, they tend not to pay afterward. No. When the the 2007 re mm -hmm. reform was done, it was, was the act put in place that's as it's written now, I guess? Is it, was it, has it been changed really much? Patrice and Allison, basically, no, the act, was it put in place in other cities, you mean? Right. Yes, the, the language, one of the things is the language you see in this ordinance, I'm going to have Paul stay up because we're going to get the police power side, the health, safety, welfare side, which is the non-financial right. side of it. <clears throat> but ultimately... The language that you see, and Allison touched on this in this ordinance, is the common language you see up and down the state of Alabama. And it is it derived from the 2007 tax, which was done at the state level. Yes. Municipalities can't can oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Thank Just so the people you, thank tuning you. in can hear you. Yep. All right. Municipalities from across the state um, came together, and there were a couple of people who were, a couple of cities who were um, leads on this, but... They authored this with the help of the legal municipalities, and that language was in there across the board. And that's why you see it so common mm -hmm. in the ordinances that, that we've seen. So um, I think touching on that, there, there's a whole other component. Well, there's two things. One, I want Latrice to cover real quick. If you don't have a business license, so this runs past a year, and you're supposed to renew your business license annually, uh, do we have the authority then to shut you down? Uh, no. <laughs> so there's been some confusion. So that I think the question is, are businesses operating without a business license and still collecting our taxes and still not paying and they don't have a business license and so on? The answer is yes, that is the case. Because again, without going to district court or you passing this provision in an ordinance, we cannot shut them down or keep them. Are we able to going. track the number of businesses that are doing that? <clears throat> when we find them, there are... I don't want to paint a picture that we just got everything no. under control here, but there are businesses that we know are operating without a license. Yes, because we have not issued that license. So we do track those and we know who they are. I'm assuming those businesses are not paying their taxes as well or, or are they? That's 
Well, when I say they don't have a license, we have not issued the license because they owe back taxes. I understand. So also there are times, too, it doesn't mean the state's not getting their money, or it also doesn't mean that the state hasn't taken them to court. And once they get them in district court, we've got to take a number and wait for them to finish their process before we can get to them. Meanwhile, said business is hanging out there doing whichever, and we are still stuck not getting our money, nor can we file on top of them and go to court. We've got to wait for the state to finish. And we're not always the only victims in the case. Yes. We've had um, landlords. They weren't getting their money. It's a lot of, it, it's not just the city. It affects the other citizens and the other property owners in our town that as well because they're behind and they're there. They're taking up space. And we just want them to come in compliance with what, is already in place. Our, our ordinance that are already set, we just want them to know about by the rules. Fairness. On the financial piece, do you have any more questions? I want to jump to the health safety welfare piece where you've gotten the majority of the questions. And why I said what I said earlier is people are, again, coming up with a lot of questions, at, at, you know, as if that you your sign is illegal and we're going to invoke this provision under health safety welfare. Um, <clears throat> to shut you down. And I want Paul to touch on, a, you know, a basic power of a city is a police power to protect the health, safety, and welfare. If we don't invoke that authority, we have no right to have zoning. We have no right to do a lot of things that we do. It's a very basic um, fundamental right. And Allison touched on, you can't be arbitrary and capricious in your application of health, safety, and welfare. These are for extreme circumstances. And as I've mentioned before in the in the same time frame Latrice was mentioning in the 2012-13 time frame, we did shut one business down under a current state law provision about health, safety, and welfare, but it only is applicable to houses of entertainment and places that sell deadly weapons. Um, and that was we had had some, some uh, issues with shootings and other things going on at a particular business, and the council took exception to that, as public safety did, as the city manager's office did, and others, and the council did vote to close that business. Uh, and absolutely, but if that business had been something else, you know, um, they were selling, um, you know, lawn equipment and the same thing was going on there and you were having shootings and I'm not saying that that would happen just as an example, the council would have not had the authority to make that decision. And that in, in the whole way we justify that is a police power, public health, safety, welfare was threatened by that business being open and the activity going on there. But, Paul, do you want to just touch on that being a general sure. power? I of the still state? have a question on the, sure. on the finance part. If, if there's basically no consequences to not, to not having a business license, why would anybody bother to apply and get a fee for a business license? You are correct. I mean, we, that's why we're wanting the council to make this decision because we want there to be consequences behind not getting a license, and that is your business cannot open the door. Now, there, there are other back-end mm -hmm. consequences. If you're brand new and you just built a building and, you know, you can't get a business license without a certi certificate of occupancy, there's other, there's other triggers and mechanisms, but we're talking about people typically that have been operating mm -hmm. that now don't have a business. They had a business license and now they don't have one, and we don't have a mechanism to shut their doors. How does this work practically? Do, do we send a, like a police officer or a public safety individual to the business to like chain the door? I mean, like, not, not until we have the authority from the city council or the district court to do so. And the district court, is, as Latrice called it, the high sheriff has to go lock the door. But typically, okay. um, if, it, if it is through this ordinance, I'm not sure if it's still the sheriff or if it is us. I think it's the city. Yeah, I think it becomes the city if you adopt this ordinance. Okay. So, Paul, can you? Kelly, did that answer your yeah, question? Yeah. Uh, so when a, I, when there's a, really no incentive for anybody to get a business license. I mean, if they're already operating in town, let their license lapse, not pay the fee. Well, we do have in incentive to take them to uh, court, they got municipal, municipal court. court. If you are a brand new business mm -hmm. and you decide to open up without a, a license, you have not come in to apply for your license. Then we have the ability to tell you to stop your business you are in violation now are there fees associated with that yes. as well okay. yes there are fines and fees but if you're an existing business you're existing business and you've been operating we can't stop you from operating 
Well, so, mind you, we've got, you know, over 7,100 people that are licensed. So, you know, you're talking about a rarity. But the frustration is I think people mm -hmm. assume when you, when you cycle a year with a business license, okay, we've got you there. Now we can shut you down because you didn't renew your business license. Um, I can tell you our staff does a great job of chasing a lot of very astute and kind business people who do pay, but we spend a lot of time reminding them as deadlines get close, please come in and renew your business mm -hmm. license so you don't get penalties. Um, we don't we don't enjoy assessing penalties. And the council, I mean, I know I've been involved uh, since I've been uh, a council member. We have the right to waive those penalties, mm -hmm. especially if staff recommends if it's the first time that's happened. Uh, if there's good. Well, they pay penalties. It is the... They have to pay certain penalties for being delinquent, but it's right. it's a it's a late fee provision of for a, yeah. business license is thirty percent. It's fifteen percent for the first thirty days that you're delinquent, and then thirty percent, period. Yeah. So it's not a whole lot. Connie, did you have another question? I did. I, I, you know, it it goes back to um, when they go before the court, and um, the last option for the judge is to. You know, um, put them in jail or they pay fines. And you said uh, at the end of the day, they're probably still not going to pay the cost and everything. So, uh, what is what is jail time? It must be a couple of days or something that somebody. I would have to look at the the ordinance specifically to know the particularized number of days associated with the. But it would be just a number of days. It would it would be a violation, not a misdemeanor. Um, and so it would be a minimal amount of jail time. And so when they when they go to jail, so I thought that when a, when somebody goes to jail, there's restitution behind it. There's no not in this particularized case, no, because there's no individual victim. Uh, there are laws that govern restitution to individual victims, but not municipalities. Uh, municipalities can recoup costs in restitution if property is damaged in a criminal act, but not paying fees is not the type of restitution that would be available to the municipal courts. And I guess my whole my whole thought on on uh, the city council having something to do with it, if if the courts can't get the money, I mean, how, how is the city council going to be able to do this? And and, and I know that you know that probably a talk amongst the city council if, if this is something we decide to do. I'm just trying to figure out at the end of the day if they're not going to pay for the courts, then they're not going to pay for us and the business still stay open. Now, the ordinance we're proposing would allow the city council to make that decision whether the business gets to stay open or not. And it, at that stage, if the city council deemed that they were going to close a business for non-payment, um, after a tremendous amount of evidence and discussion, that means the doors will be locked by a public safety official, a police officer, or a sheriff's officer, and they will not be able to operate. That's what that means. So then the court has the same authority, but two different courts. Municipal court is a lot what you're referring to, and then the district court is a different side of that. So real quickly, um, police powers, I, I, a lot of you have had a, a lot of questions about, and I think there's not a general understanding about police powers and, and health, safety, welfare, and, and what that really means. And I, I understand and respect what a lot of people have had to say, but when we say violation under color of such license, you know, of, of any ordinance of the city, um, it means a lot of things, and it can mean anything that we haven't anticipated to date. But certainly was it, what it doesn't mean is a minor violation of the zoning ordinance. It doesn't mean, um, you know, we, we have other mechanisms. If you're spewing raw sewage, that's a public health, safety, welfare issue. We have different mechanisms to deal with that because that could really make the public sick. What we are talking about most often are criminal acts going on uh, of which the current state law does not cover and we are also not talking about a an employee who has been working at a business is off for the night um, has a few drinks and gets a DUI that has nothing to do with the business and that's that's been a concern of some folks um, but it does mean if your employees are dealing drugs out of your business and it's considered a public health safety welfare threat and you've done nothing about it and the council deems this is a public health safety welfare threat to the city that does mean that it gives you the authority to choose whether or not to close them down. 
you may deem okay, owner had no knowledge and we're okay with this and it's been cleaned up and the business can remain in operation, but it's putting the authority in your hands. You want to just go over briefly, police powers? Yeah, uh, very, 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 very briefly. And my role as outside counsel for the city intersects with this issue quite often, and in particular in relation to the short-term rental ordinance litigation. This body's authority to implement zoning ordinances arises from the police power. You hear that phrase used, and it is simply this body's authority to legislate on a local level to protect and promote the safety, health, welfare, and morals of the citizenry of, this, of Auburn. Uh, that power is specifically delegated uh, to municipalities in the state by the state legislature. Uh, as many of you know, in Alabama, the only authority, inherent authority, to govern and legislate is with the state. Municipal uh, corporations like the city of Auburn have no inherent powers. Only the powers that have been delegated to them by the state through the legislative process. And the state has specifically done that in relation to generating ordinances which protect and promote the safety, health, welfare, and morals of its citizens. And so the prime example has already been talked about briefly. It's the zoning ordinances. Uh, anytime a city passes a zoning ordinance, the first question is, does it have any relation to those four things? If it doesn't have any relationship to any of those things, then it is not a valid ordinance. Uh, however, if there is even an arguable connection, what they call in law a sus substantial relationship to the safety, health, morals, and welfare of the citizenry, then that is presumed in court to be a valid ordinance. And so someone challenging a zoning ordinance that has a substantial relationship to any of those four categories, or all of them, has to overcome that presumption uh, as part of the litigation. Now, that power is specifically uh, limited to the creation of legislation by a municipal governing body. That is your job, is to legislate. The enforcement of any legislation uh, generally falls on staff members, but even more particular in our form of government here in the city of Auburn, it is specifically relegated to um, the staff of the city, not the legislative body. There are prohibitions in the state code which prohibit you as legislators from enforcing uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the legislation that you create. Uh, there are intentionally not a lot of restrictions on what is safety, health, welfare, and morals. There's no case law in the state of Alabama that specifically defines any of those terms. There's no statute in the state of Alabama that specifically defines those terms, and that is purposeful because that then gives you very broad authority to legislate on those topics as the local government deems necessary for its citizens. So it gives you as much power as it can with two primary restrictions. Number one, the city legislation cannot uh, conflict with state law. Uh, not the state constitution, not state statutes, not state regulations that the legislature uh, has in, empowered um, a body to create. And so that is the first question anyone asks when they look at a city ordinance based on the police power. Does it conflict with another state law? The second limitation on your authority to legislate under the police power uh, has already been mentioned tonight as well, and it's probably the broadest of the two primary restrictions, and that is that neither the legislation itself nor the enforcement of that legislation can either be arbitrary or capricious. So that means you can't create a zoning ordinance to address a single citizen. That's arbitrary and capricious. You can create a zoning ordinance under the police power that broadly addresses the needs of the entire community or portions of the community, but you can't single out individuals, you can't single out pieces of property, you can't single out 
businesses individually or even classifications of businesses individually. Can you single out particular violations? Certainly when you get to the enforcement side. So when you create legislation that provides enforcement protocols within it, obviously the people who are going to be on the receiving end of the enforcement are the violators of that statute. But you're not saying that those violators are ABC business because you're not creating this legislation because a particularized <clears throat> business is not paying its, its uh, taxes. You're creating this because there is a problem uh, with people not paying their taxes and there's no particularized enforcement for those violators. So certainly, violators, if they are a general class of citizenry, are acceptable. But if you, if you attempt to single out any particular person or class of business uh, that's not violating the other portions of the statute, that would be suspect, and that could be challenged in court. But that's not the case here. Uh, this is, is the, the legislation before this body for approval does not do that. It does not single out any particular business, individual, or even group of businesses. Well, but Paul, if, we, if I was going to bring something forward to the council, because the council doesn't have the authority under this ordinance to bring any such violation forward, I would have vetted that with our legal team, and it better meet all the health, safety, welfare tests, and it also better be something that the council's probably said something to me about or is concerned about or public safety is concerned about. These are extremely rare, and I've given you examples in another city. There was a in a city in South Alabama, somebody was dealing drugs out of a tire shop, and the, the police came, you know, through the governing body and said, look, we've arrested multiple people, we've got surveillance video, we've got all of it, but we're asking you to not keep this business open because this is a threat to the community at the moment. And citizens came out at the public hearing and said, we love this business, please don't close it. I mean, it, it went back and forth a little bit. The council ultimately voted to close it, but what it is is it's it's putting that authority in your hands with evidence. You get evidence like anybody else gets and you make that decision. But I'm gonna tell you um, in terms of how this city manager would enforce this, this better be something extreme and it better be something that is a major threat. It, this is not something that any of us want to do, but if we felt the need to do it and my public safety department is advising me we've got a serious issue, then I'm, I'm gonna bring it to you and put that, that in your hands. Why, why does state code only address two types, two categories, houses um, or places of entertainment and those who um, operate or sell deadly weapons. Do we, do we have any understanding of why just those two categories and why it's not more broad at the state level? No is the answer to that question. Um, there are lots of things within the Code of Alabama that we can question once we see the enforcement and, and uh, uh, um, when we get further into the enforcement, we can question the, the wisdom of. Unfortunately, I think the short answer to that question is those are the only two things that some state legislature has proposed for the state to address. And like I said, it's an unusual move, though, that you do have the authority for revocation, meaning if you so choose to adopt an ordinance that allows that. So as we've discussed before, you often have limited powers. So that, you know, that's what this ultimately is about for the staff is whether or not the council wants to take this on or if we're heading some things to district court. Um, on the health, safety, welfare side, um, the goal is to put decisions in your hand for what's best for the community. But at the end of the day, if you don't want to proceed with that, then we're going to stick with houses of entertainment and places that sell deadly weapons. I mean, that's it's pure and simple. Um, we're trying to put authority in the elected body's hands, but it's certainly up to you um, how and if you proceed. Is it possible to proceed on uh, one aspect of the ordinance and not the other? The, yes, it is. The, the, the taxing authority piece without proceeding on the, the, the health and and welfare it piece. is and yeah. you know this body also has the the authority to adopt ordinances it has the authority to repeal ordinances future councils have the same authority so I mean the decision is purely yours and we are absolutely here to provide information so that you can make a decision whatever that is that's what you're elected to do <coughs> any other questions I think a concern that I've heard about the language the broadness of this language is while 
while people are appreciative of this current uh, arrangement of people and city manager and council, what is what is to stop once an, an ordinance such as this under under a reasonable body, once that body has left and a, perhaps a more a more heavy handed body uh, is here and a more heavy handed, less sensitive city manager is at the helm, what are the implications of that? Should somebody have in a, in a position of control uh, be of a vindictive nature and use this uh, ordinance uh, in a manner that it wasn't <laughs> intended. That's been a concern that I've heard more than, more than once. That's why I just said what I said. This body can adopt whatever it wants and repeal whatever it wants. So if you didn't adopt this, the next city council could step forward and adopt it just the same. As we've been over, the council doesn't have the authority to bring any of this forward. Only the city manager does. And I, in, in my world, I operate on a contract, and whether it's me or anybody else, legislative body is the ultimate arbiter of policy for the city. So at the end of the day, it 100% rests with the council no matter what. So at any given moment, somebody can pass an ordinance or they can repeal one. <laughs> doesn't matter who's sitting at the dais. Um, yes, the city manager has the authority to bring things forward, but at the end of the day, the governing body is the final authority, including in the current situation with going to district court. So I would say to citizens, you better pay careful attention to municipal elections regardless, because anybody could make that decision at any time. Um, this is, though, I want to, for everybody listening, be very careful. The council you know, has had questions about business license revocation over the years. They're not bringing this forward. This is a staff function, and we brought forward, whereas short-term rentals was a council function, and that's the council brought that forward and wanted a policy made. So there are two ways to do that, and they both work. Um, and, and this is in the operations of the city and enforcement of ordinances why we're bringing this forward. But it's certainly the f sole decision of the governing body what we do from here forward. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Paul. Any other questions? Megan, certainly thank you for the time tonight to answer all these questions. I certainly encourage the council to continue to process this and um, continue to ask the city manager your questions. I like and, to encourage uh, the public as well, and Mayor. I encourage we, the public, absolutely. The public, we've got till January 17th before you hear this We're scheduled again. to take this up on January the 17th. We're not scheduled to make any decision on this tonight. Um, so there's plenty of time for you. Um, if you'd like to reach out to any of your council members or certainly the staff and ask those questions, please do that as we approach January the 17th. But certainly appreciate the time tonight. All right, are there any questions on tonight's agenda for the city manager? City All right, manager, Mayor, real quick, for us? item 8B has been removed. That is the water resource uh, management manual, uh, design and construction manual changes. We just had a, a few last minute questions and what I'd rather just remove it from the agenda. We'll work with the people who had questions. We did um, send out some initial information for feedback and we sent some more out and, and folks are really busy and we certainly don't mind accommodating that. So I'd rather just withdraw that from the agenda and we'll put it back on once we've had the meetings we need to have past the holidays with everybody. And then 8C5 um, is in front of you, and that's with Gulf States Distributors. We just, we, uh, those are purchase of some rifles, and it was called an HNK MP7 on there, um, and the invoice said an MP781. It's, a, it's just a printed, it was a little stapled um, agenda item on the dais in front of you. And so all we're doing is changing the model number and the resolution to match. What's in the you said 8C5, it's 8C3, correct? Oh, sorry. You know, I should wear my glasses more often. Not a problem. Yes. Okay, good. All right, any other questions? All right, is there a move to adjourn the Committee of the Whole? So moved. So moved. All right, we'll adjourn the Committee of the Whole, and we'll immediately go right into our City Council meeting, and we'll open tonight's Auburn City Council meeting. Lindsay with a roll call. Adams? Here. Oblentz? Here. Dawson? Here. Griswold? Here. Mormon? Here. Parsons? Here. Taylor? Here. Whitten? Here. Anders? Here. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and please remain standing for a moment of silence. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Thank you. Please be seated. During the Committee of the Whole tonight, there were a couple of uh, appointments that the City Council made for the Board of Education. Blake Prestridge was appointed to uh, fill the unexpired term of Dr. Terry Jenkins. He'll begin to serve immediately, and that term will end May 31st of 2026. And then Stacy Giles was reappointed to the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Stacy had served one full term and was seeking a second full term. Again, I want to say thank you to everybody that has been a willing participant in applying for these opportunities. And then the city council, uh, I mean, the city manager and her staff just made a presentation to the city council about the business license ordinance amendment. And uh, the city council is scheduled to take this up on January the 17th. Under mayor's announcements tonight, I want to um, start off by uh, we have had an announcement of a retirement and our public safety director, Paul Register, will be retiring at the end of next month. And I want to publicly say for the first time, thank you, Paul, for everything that you've done for our city as a police officer and certainly as the police chief and then recently as our public safety director. And we thank you and uh, look forward to spending time with you in your retirement and look forward to uh, uh, all the good things you have ahead for you. And I'm proud to announce and thank the city manager for immediately appointing uh, Will Matthews as our next public safety director. And Will will be taking over in February. And Will, we're excited to work with you. And uh, we're um, you're very deserving of this opportunity, and you're going to do a great job. And the council looks forward to working with you. Uh, speaking of uh, public safety, in the last week, I've gotten to attend the fire in the police Christmas party. What a great group of people. Uh, that are protecting us every day. Um, got to meet many of them's families and just enjoy some good casual time with uh, those men and women who protect us, and I'm just grateful for that. Uh, this past Friday, we had a Habitat for Humanity house dedication uh, here in Auburn. What a beautiful story to see a wonderful family receive a house here right before Christmas. Uh, I certainly want to thank all the staff at Stone Martin for building that house and all of their subs that participated and the city participated as well. But um, what a great day last Friday afternoon. Recently, uh, the leadership team from Tupelo, Mississippi came to Auburn and wanted to see our new uh, Town Creek Inclusive Playground. And um, I appreciate being out, uh, provided the opportunity to go and meet their mayor and, and talk to him about what they're looking at trying to do over in Tupelo. And again, we should all be proud that we have a facility like that in our community that's serving all of our children, all of our families, uh, and particularly those with special needs. Very proud of that. And then the Polar Plunge is coming up next month. It's on January the 28th. It's a great fundraiser for the Lee County Special Olympics. And I wanted to ask um, Representative uh, Parsons over here. Um, You've participated in the Polar Plunge recently, and we've got three rookies with us, and I didn't know if you had anything you'd like to encourage them about. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> become a, a council tradition, uh, Mr. Mayor, that uh, you're on your first year of serving. Uh, we, uh, we look forward to seeing the, the new folk joining us in January. Good. Thank you for that decisive and assertive recommendation on their part. All right. <laughs> It is a great, great morning. All right. Anybody else have an announcement they'd like to make tonight? I know Ms. Taylor has something she'd like to say. Yes. I, I just want to say this past Sunday, um, uh, I would like to send some shout outs to uh, the Borkin staff for being uh, great with assisting us and helping with the Christmas party for the Scouts. And they did a wonderful job at, at um, helping set up and tear down. And I also want to um, thank the uh, Auburn Toy Drive for their uh, contributions and donations to the Christmas party. And I also want to thank um, Mayor Ron Anders for his contribution to, uh, for our children. And they were very, very ha happy to get these toys and to enjoy a um, day of fun, food, Santa Claus, and the whole nine yards. And while I said, uh, I just had one of my wife apps to walk in. So I just, uh, we have a, two scout troops, and they're called wife apps and match. So I had one of my wife apps to, to she, she got her head down right now, but it's actually my granddaughter. <laughs> and she's, <laughs> she just walked in. But we, we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done. And, and um, we appreciate everything that all our donations and things that we do, that we try to do to serve our communities 
uh, with the seniors and with our children. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Appreciate your hard work. Anyone else on the council have an announcement they'd like to make? Mr. Mayor, I do. Sure. I'd just like to say Merry Christmas to all the citizens of Auburn and all of our uh, employees, Megan and her staff. Uh, it's easy to set up here and talk about doing a job, but you guys got here day and night and do the job from, from the newest employee to the most experienced employer. And uh, I'm very appreciative to live in a city to have a bunch of dedicated professionals such as yourselves and all, of, all the people that work for the city of Auburn. Uh, you, most of you, almost all of my had dealings with from, from on a personal level have been very professional, and it just makes me proud to be a citizen. And Merry Christmas to all of y'all, and wish we could do more for you than we do for you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Anyone else? I'd like to second that. <clears throat> I'd like to point out some very fine work that the city has done. The city staff. Uh, they there's a new page. Uh, it's a tool for all of us to use, which tracks the status of our major improvement projects, and it is very good. It, it gives you a bird's eye view of the projects, as well as estimated completion dates, as well as budget information, and it's, it's really, really extraordinary. Um, you can assess that or access that at auburnalabama.org forward slash CIP, which stands, I think, for uh, Capital Improvement Plan, is that right? And uh, not sure who to brag on there. I, I assume that this project uh, crosses several departmental lines. Uh, I'm sure Greg Nelson had a big hand in it, but I'm sure a lot of people did. So I, I'm bragging on everybody because I know it includes just a lot of people. So, and Merry Christmas to you all. Anyone else? Certainly before we move forward, Merry Christmas to our community. Hope we have a happy new year, and thank you for being a great town, and uh, we're all honored to represent you up here. And to our staff, thank you for all your hard work. And a number of people will be working during Christmas and New Year's while the rest of us are playing and having fun with our families, and thank you for making those sacrifices. But we're grateful for all of you. Okay, we'll move forward. Auburn University Communications. Okay, how about that? A substitute. <laughs> Good to have you. Hello everyone, hope y'all are doing well. Just to introduce myself or reintroduce myself, I'm Anna Coker. I'm filling in for Olivia tonight, our Director of City Relations. Good to be back up here. Wow, I really missed it. Um, so we just had our December graduation and you know there are countless amazing stories of graduates, but I did want to highlight um, a son and his mom graduated together out of our computer science and software engineering program. So they're really taking the Auburn family to the next level, literally. Um, so I just wanted to congratulate them for that. We're really proud of them. And speaking of Auburn graduates, you all might have heard Octavia Spencer, might have heard of her. She's a very famous actress, graduated from Auburn, and she just received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And Abby flew all the way out to California to be there with her. Um, they let him on the plane, and a tiger on the plane. But anyway, um, so we're very excited for her. You know, she does a lot for us. Every uh, final season, she gives us a free meal. So that's really exciting. We love her. Uh, next Wednesday, we have a men's basketball game, Wednesday the 28th at night um, in the arena against Florida. So if you're feeling inclined, please go out and support the team. Um, and then you might have noticed it's kind of quiet. You might be going through drive throughs a little faster now. <laughs> Students are on Christmas and winter break. So the uh, term will start January 11th, which is a Wednesday. So thank you. Thank you, Anna. Okay. More Eagle. Merry Christmas. All right, city manager's communications. No, oh, excuse me. Citizens Communications on agenda on tonight's agenda. So if you'd like to speak to the council about anything on tonight's agenda, this will be your opportunity to come forward. Please give us your name and address for the record and know that you'll have five minutes. Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, Good Samuel evening. Ames with Goodwin Mills K. Wood. Uh, I am here on behalf of uh, B&B Self Storage Center. Uh, the applicant is here as well. Uh, we are requesting rezoning. It is... Uh, ordinance 9b2 and I know that there was um, some current concern previously about what might go there uh, after some meetings with the staff and several phone calls and uh, conversations we have decided uh, that we will not be doing uh, what we had originally intended of the car wash and storage facilities we understand that that is not within the um, future land use that does not fit that after discussing with the staff uh, we will um, continue to work with them and go forward but we do wish to continue forward with the rezoning and uh, we are happy to answer any questions that you might have and the applicant 
uh, will also be coming up here just to uh, comment on a few things as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Merry Christmas. Merry I'm Christmas. Bill Mackey from Demopolis. I graduated from Auburn in uh, 81. Uh, I have a condo here and I'm trying to get relocated back to this area. But uh, Mr. Mackey, hold on just one second. Do we need his physical address in Demopolis? Yeah, just it's just for the record. Yeah. Just for the record. Yeah. Two, 210 North Strawberry Avenue, Demopolis. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to um, interrupt. I have this pro property with my partner under contract. Uh, we went under contract in uh, 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 September to close in January, uh, subject to the zoning change. Uh, the zoning we're asking for is in your 2030 plan that all of that should be what we're asking for. Uh, we initially came up with two ideas that we have scratched after talking with the, uh, the uh, staff. And so we're looking at some item that like a hotel or a restaurant now that might would fit the staff's blessings and also on our property. So uh, we would like to go forward tonight with a zoning change, uh, even though we have to come back for the uh, uh, conditional use to get our blessings there of whatever we uh, come up with on the site. So we're asking for uh, the zoning change. Uh, but we don't have an exact uh, end user yet. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Mackey? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to address the council about items on tonight's agenda? Okay. We'll move ahead now with city manager's communications. All right, as I mentioned during Committee of the Whole, item 8D, um, had, I'm sorry, 8B, I can't speak tonight, has been removed from the agenda. So... Um, the first item of business is a consent agenda. Mayor, does any member of the council wish to remove an item from the consent agenda and deal with that item individually? Yeah. Anyone? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I'd Please. like to remove 8C1. 8C1. And 8C3. 8C1 and 8C3. All right. Anyone else? Right. Okay, item, we'll start with 8C1. Item 8C1 authorizes the purchase of various equipment for the soccer complex expansion from BSN Sports in the amount of $72,598.59. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Griswold. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I fully support this. I just want to make it clear to the public that the resolution says that the Auburn Soccer Association will be paying for this and that the city is only being used as a contracting conduit for it. So if anyone had a misconception that we're spending an additional $72,000 for this, you know, on top of some of the other things we've already authorized for the soccer complex, I just want to make that clear to the public. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Certainly we're excited about what's going on at the soccer complex. I rode by there yesterday and the three new fields that are being built with the new indoor. It's going to be a beautiful complex out there and it's going to serve our children for generations to come. We're excited about that. Any other? Okay, we have a motion second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, 8C3. Item 8C3 authorizes the purchase of 22 H&K MP7A1 rifles and magazines for the police department from Gulf States distributors in the amount of $49,654. Move for approval. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Mr. Griswold, turn it back over to you. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, I initially had concerns because this is a sole source contract, and uh, I'm an advocate of competitive bids. But after discussion with the city manager, I'm convinced that uh, the Gulf States is the appropriate source for this uh, as allowed by state law to, uh, as an exemption to uh, competitive bids. So if anyone had a question as to why we didn't do that, it's because of a specific exemption in state law that allows us to have a sole source contract for this, this type of item. Okay. Right. Any other further comments or questions? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Do I have a motion to, to approve the balance of the consent agenda? So moved. I have second. a motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the consent agenda is approved. Ordinances. 
Under ordinances, item 9A1 is a request from the City of Auburn to annex approximately 9.16 acres of property located at 7284 U.S. Highway 280 West, known as the Public Safety Training Center. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its December 8th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. I have a motion to second. Does anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with the vote on this this evening? Here, none. Is there any questions or comments? I would just like to say I'm very excited about this being on the north end of town, and I think it's going to be a great asset as you come into our community. So I'm looking forward to the progress of it. I agree with you, Ms. Witten. It's going to be a great access to our men and women who protect us. Really looking forward to them receiving that training here and us for being a hub for training for all of our neighbors around there, the East Alabama area. Okay. Anything else? All right, Lindsay, with the roll call. Adams? Yes. Koblenz? Yes, ma'am. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Griswold? Yes, ma'am. Mormon? Yes, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Witten? Yes. Andrew. Yes. Item 9A2 is a request from Chase and Kimberly Davis to annex approximately 6.08 acres located at 311 Lee Road 26, also known as Alla Hill Drive. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its December 8th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. I have a motion and seconds. Anyone on the council have a problem moving forward to the vote on this this evening? All right, hearing none, any comments or questions? Okay, Lindsay, roll call. Oblitz? Yes, ma'am. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Griswold? Yes, ma'am. Mormon? Yes, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Whitten? Yes. Adams? Yes. Yes. Item 9A3 is a request from Little Brown Dog LLC and PKG Holdings LLC to annex approximately 36.46 acres of property located on the north side of Shell Toomer Parkway between Automotive Boulevard and Canary Drive. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its November 10th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary. I'll induce ordinance and ask unanimous consent. Second. I have a motion to second. Does anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with vote on this this evening? Hear none. Any comments or questions? Mayor, I, I think this is going to be a good fit for where it's going in out there on Shell Tumor. Uh, I like the idea of the large lots, which is something I feel like we need more of in Auburn. So uh, I'm very much in favor of this. Good. Thank you, Chief Dawson. Any other further comments? And if I'm right, Miss, I'm sorry, Mayor, if I'm right, Miss uh, Megan, uh, mm -hmm. it's in the county now? It's in the county, correct. That's Thank you. That, that's even more reason to vote for it. Yeah, so it's 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 an island that sits between quite significant tracts of land that are in the city limits. Thank you. Okay. Lindsay? Yes, ma'am. Griswold? Yes, ma'am. Mormon? Yes, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Whitten? Yes. Adams? Yes. Koblenz? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Item 9B1 is a request from Little Brown Dog LLC and PKG Holdings LLC for rezoning approximately 36.46 acres of property located on the north side of Shell Tumor Parkway between Automotive Boulevard and Canary Drive from Rural. Um, it's the piece you just annexed to large lot residential. The Planning Commission recommended approval of this request at its November 10th meeting by a vote of 6 to 2. Unanimous consent is necessary and a public hearing is required. I'll introduce ordinance to ask unanimous consent. Second. Second. I have a motion seconds. Anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with a vote on this this evening? Hearing none, we'll open the public hearing. If you'd like to address the city council, please come forward and give us your name and address for the record. And remember that you have five minutes. Live at 520 Oriole Drive uh, in Whipperwill Estates. Uh, I did address the Planning Commission, um, and I appreciate everybody's attention on all of this. Um, one question that we had at that time is, in the past, uh, when West Pace development was going in and was being planned, this particular piece of property was designated by the city to remain as a buffer zone between the commercial development of West Pace and Whipperwill Estates. And in addition to that, there was a proposed bike path that went through there. Our question at the time for the Planning Commission that was not adequately answered is, what's changed? I realize that ownership of the property has changed. I realize that there's been all kinds of litigation and, and all of these sorts of things. But 
this was designated by the city council. It was brought up no less than seven times um, and decided that this should remain a buffer zone. This should have a bike path going through it. I think originally the, the idea was to tie in the um, Shell Tumor Parkway bike path with Town Creek and go across the interstate. I don't know how all that would work, but that was the intention at the time. It was designated for that. Um, now, with change of ownership of the property, we seem to be ready to rubber stamp a new development here. Um, and there's been no mention, there's been no explanation to the citizens that live there that we're counting on a buffer zone and that we're counting on a, a bike path. I would also suggest um, respectfully to the city council that there's a reason why Auburn is consistently rated one of the best places in Alabama to move to. Uh, it's not a new subdivision. It's the preserving the character of this um, city. It's preserving uh, some ecology. There's wetlands that go through that, that area. There is um, all sorts of wildlife there. Uh, and we're proposing, once you, once you get rid of it, you can't get it back. Once you turn that into a subdivision and uh, you develop it, you're, you lose that natural resource. And you lose, I would say, some of the things that, that give Auburn its character and make Auburn what it is. Now, I will admit, I've got a strong vested interest in that because I live in the house that my dad built. Mm -hmm. I moved into that house in 1976. I was five years old. Um, after he passed and mom couldn't keep the house anymore, I bought it from him. But I, <clears throat> I grew up running around in those woods. So, you know, I'm, I'm obviously very biased about this. But I will tell you that um, it is a natural resource for the city. And once it's gone, it's gone. I'd urge the council to please consider carefully uh, whether we go for the brass ring and grab a subdivision that's being proposed and give away something that's a little more intangible, but at the same time, something that is intrinsically valuable and builds the character of the city. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Any discussions or questions from the council? Yes, sir, Mayor, if I may. Uh, Please. The city didn't own that piece of property, did it? No, the, the West Pace agreement was contemplated um, for a long time. And one, one big challenge, this did come up at Planning Commission, is um, the West Pace development agreement has zero to do with zoning and or subdivision regulations. They're completely unrelated legally, which is often hard for people to understand. And yes, and absolutely, uh, the Whippoorwill subdivision had a lot of concerns about the West Pace development. There were two different development agreements passed. Um, while I was a more junior staff member at the time, I worked with Philip Dunlap as one of his people that he did a lot of the work on this along with the city manager's office. But behind the scenes, I, I also worked on this. And in research, as the person who was submitting things to the city council agenda, there were two different agreements passed. There was a 2008 agreement that was never implemented. And then the agreement that was implemented was adopted in 2009. The difference between the 2009 agreement and the 2008 agreement had everything to do with this parcel in question. There were other major nuances, but not germane to the discussion today. And this parcel in question um, initially was part of the entire West Pace development in the 2008 agreement, and there was to be a buffer and a bike trail and so on. In the 2009 agreement, uh, the then owner of the property took this acreage and said, I don't want to include this in the development agreement, period. I don't want it in here. I'm not annexing it. I'm not zoning it. It'll be left in the county. And that's where it stood until this evening when you annexed it. Um, it's been out in the county. So the agreement does call on the existing West Pace property for the bike trail that was mentioned and a 100-foot buffer. Um, the agreement calls out a piece of it, and then the drawings all show it on the current West Pace property. I have kicked this to our legal counsel who has interpreted that the buffer belongs on the existing West Pace property. So right now that property is not developed at all, and no, the bike trail hasn't been built, and that is something that I'm working through with our legal counsel. But at the end of the day, that's an action on a, on a different piece of property and doesn't currently involve this acreage. 
and that is two different legal counsels, both Brad uh, Rod Canner from Bradley, Aran, and Birmingham, that is our bond counsel, as well as the city attorney's office have been looking at this. Some residents reached out, and I don't have a final answer about what happens to the bike path itself, but I, I do have an answer that this acreage is not involved. And so, do we ha um, um, So if we don't approve this tonight, it, it still could have anything built on that piece of property that we really wanted to, couldn't it? And you've now approved the annexation. It, it's rural in nature, but yes, it, anything in the rural zone could happen. Just and I, you know, unless Mr. Foote corrects me, the um, staff, this is an, an unexpected use for this area. I think staff recommended approval and is in support of this in terms of it meeting our land use plan and, and other things that we expect and sees it as compatible. This is actually a little bit of a buffer area between what is heavily zoned commercial um, and Whipperwill subdivision. One of the challenges about West Pace, and people need to understand, it is part of a planned development district, and it is not allowed to have any residential on it. Unless this, this body were to agree to do that, it, it is a purely commercial development, period. I mean, that was by design at the time the, the deal was done. And I think our citizen that, that came up and had questions is absolutely right. There is also a major complications with many things due to a bankruptcy and ownership, but I can assure you it has no impact on zoning or subdivision regulations whatsoever, and it doesn't involve this piece of property in question right now. Well, I'd much rather see the large lot residential. I had more in yeah. or commercial or anything or that, that, that close to Will, Will, Will Estates. I, too, remember when Will, Will was built over there, and I understand where you're coming from, roaming those woods all your life. I've done much the same on Cox and South College myself. But uh, I also have to respect the person wanting to uh, develop that piece of property and keep it within keeping of what's in the community already. Whipple Wheel is one of the nicest subdivisions. Or it's a good, well-kept secret, I think, a lot of times. But I'm, I'm just happy we got somebody that wants that property that's going to build something similar to Whipple Wheel. So that, that's where I'm at on this. I'd also like to have our uh, Executive Director of Development Services address that on the side of Budding Whipper Will in particular, and I know the engineer for the project is here, there's a lot of environmental considerations. This isn't, this isn't property that um, isn't full of wetlands, among other things. Yes, and I applaud the developer for working with us and staff for working um, with coming up with this plan, um, looking at some ways that we minimize the the amount of land that has to be cleared for you know for the lots and and for the roads to be constructed um there is some uh, prime area there that's been referenced as far as creek but there's lots of flood plains and wetlands within that area and that'll be identified and we'll deal with that during the development review team process and proving the development and i apologize the creek's on the opposite side it's on the west pace side not abutting whipper will but you have drawings in your packet. We showed you a potential layout. Um, while that's not for your consideration, Planning Commission did see that, and I want to make sure you understood what the lot layout looked like. Megan, if, if I understood you correctly, there still is a buffer? So... But the buffer is on... It's on the other piece. So if you're looking at, the, at a drawing in your packet that says copy of preliminary plat, um, you can see Creek. It's in the kind of dotted area. The buffer would be on the other side of that to the West Pace development. You see the creek running through? Yes. See? To the right, yeah. as we're looking at the dock. Yeah. yeah, and so it's to the right, yes. They'll, that is that, and the agreement says a, a bike trail and a 100-foot buffer is what the agreement says. It says there's a current um, bike trail in the north, traverses the north end of this property. Will that remain, or will that um, do It's the name? Shell Tumor Bikeway. Yeah, so it, but it traverses the north end of the It property. does. The, the notion at the time with the neighbors, if memory serves me correctly, um, not just wanting a bike trail down to the interstate, which there are definitely some public safety concerns about that because no street would be running down that way, not an easy, easy thing to monitor. But um, at the end of the day, the concern was with continued curb cuts from the West Pace development and now this – part of that concern becomes as you're riding along that, that trail or bike trail, you're, you're having to stop if you're on your bike or pedestrian and the same for vehicles, everybody's gotta be extremely careful. There's more conflict. So one of the notions behind the turning the bike trail was to have another, I think it was 3,500 linear feet of unimpeded, no curb cut trail. 
But yes, this will this will cause a curb cut. Well, a street building right across the trail. So yeah. All right. Any so, other questions so or comments? Since we just annexed this as rural, that basically allows for ten lots, approximately ten lots to go on it if we don't approve this reannexation. Whereas reannexation is showing about twenty-five lots, right? So we're, yeah, we're looking at twenty-five large lots versus ten three-acre rural lots. Well, it depends on, yeah, what your definition of large lot is. So large lot residential is one acre plus right. lots, and then rural doesn't allow less than a three-acre well, lot. Well, yeah, I'm just counting the number that they have on the chart here is 25. So that's, Right, right. No, I'm just explaining the difference in the in the zoning category. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> this plat, this, pl this draft um, plat, many of these are over an acre lots. Right. Okay. okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay, Lindsay, roll call. Griswold? Yes, ma'am. Foreman? Yes, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Witten? Yes. Adams? Yes. Oblant? Yes. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Yes. All right, item 9B2 is a request from B&B Self Storage Center to rezone approximately 5.69 acres of property located at 3022 Cox Road from Limited Development District to Comprehensive Development District. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its October 13th meeting. This item was postponed from the November 15th City Council meeting. A public hearing was held at that time, and you have a motion on the table. Okay. So we have a motion on the table, so we can just open up discussion. Is that That's correct? correct. Okay. Any discussion? Yes, Mayor. Comments, uh, questions? Yes, go ahead, Chief. Uh, May, uh, Megan, we approved this night. What what can be done with that piece of property? It's, uh, something similar last time. I'll have the planning director add a little more to it, but the very, very simple answer is anything from large lot residential to light industrial and everything in between. So meaning rural to to light industrial. It allows a lot of housing, commercial, office, road service uses, you name it. Um, but it's a, it's a zone that covers just about everything. Yeah, I would agree with, with Megan. There are a lot of uses that would require conditional use, but it's a pretty broad category. Mm -hmm. what, what are the, I just, <coughs> I, I just throw it out there. I, I really want this exit off I-85 to be something that was most pleasurable to the eye and, and feel of Auburn. Because if you come in from the south, it's first going to be your first exit to, into Auburn. And, and on South College, it, we really dropped the ball in some cases on South College Street. It's, it's not very pretty in some areas over there. So I would really like to uh, maybe have, the, have this studied a little more and see what, what we want to put out there and what would be the best fit and, and things of that nature. I really, I really think the city ought to take its time and, and develop a, maybe you may even have another interstate zone, right, an area around the interstate, what can be allowed, what can't be allowed. Uh, I, and this is very close to I-85, and I just, I, I really think that that's gonna be, a, and corporate's part of the outer loop eventually. So it's really gonna be a showpiece for, for the city of Auburn, I think in the next 20 years or so. So what, what can we do toward that? Well, we've studied this property off and on over time, and there had not been. We had a large property owner um, in the South College, the Exit 51 interchange area, uh, that owns a lot of property on West Veterans Boulevard as well that was concerned. There was an attempt, and Steve was a 2013-2014, to do um, something called interstate commercial. And, and the goal of the interstate commercial zone was to basically make a permitted use everything that you would – expect and I don't know that we called it interstate commercial that's what the land use plan says right uh, the proposed district was interstate commercial district and I think that's also what it is in the land use plan that's correct so they're called one and the same which is for all interstate style uses would be permitted but it prohibited things like housing that don't make I know we have housing along a lot of our interchanges but this is more of a commercial interchange in nature sitting right on exit 50. So um, part of the reason some of that didn't come forward for this particular interchange is by and large, including the piece that Bucky sits on, all four corners of it were in the county. And so you can't zone something that's not in the city limits. So you can make a land use plan that tells you what you want, want it to be. Um, 
And so um, even for Bucky's when they came in, they would have much preferred to see this this type of zoning. So that is something. And Steve, do we have the bandwidth right now to, to study this again, or do we have enough data to make recommendations fairly quickly? I believe we could take a look at what was proposed back in 2015, mm -hmm. kind of dust that off and see what we liked about it, see if there's anything that might need to be changed. But we, there's a couple of steps we would go through, but we could probably look at that in the next six months at the most. So it certainly can be studied further. The CDD zone, um, while a very flexible zone, um, we have been moving more and more away from it. A lot of South College Street was zoned as such and got changed to what's called South College Corridor District. And that was to allow uses that belonged on that corridor. And th that zoning change happened after a lot of things Chief Dawson was referring to happened. And our other problem on South College with some issues that we've had is there are pockets that are in and out of the city limits. You know, there's a number of things that sit between, say, Walmart and the interstate that are not in the city limits. And so you can develop whatever you want there without our regulations, and that becomes obvious at times. So, Interstate commercial would <clears throat> include typical things you would see off of interstate exits. So you'd yeah, and you'd make it, them uh, permitted by right instead of a conditional use. So, I mean, you're including hotels, restaurants, various things you're typical. Okay. What you're typically not including is the gamut that comes with the CDD zone of multifamily, single family housing, light manufacturing. Now, things like mini storage and so on can get involved in that, but they often don't sit on the frontage of a lot. You would put that behind a primary. You should put a hotel and a mini storage behind it, but you wouldn't make that the primary use on the frontage typically. What about uh, truck stops? Uh, would those be permitted? Well, that's going to be part of the study, and whether or not that would no be. Want truck stops. So <laughs> if that's something we pursue, but that's up to you guys. I appreciate the interest in Auburn. I appreciate the gentleman wanting to develop out there. I'm looking forward to it when it eventually happens. So I, what can we do tonight? Do, if, if, do we have any options besides just denying it, or, or can we put it off for a while and give the city time to look, look into it? Or maybe I just hate to approve something like this and, and not knowing what's going to be put there on that on that lot. Understood. I mean, yes, you can theoretically postpone, but if you postpone, the only request in and went through the planning commission and was advertised is for the comprehensive development district. We don't have an interstate commercial district created yet. One has not been established. There is a good bit of paperwork on it. So your only choice would be if that's a route that you want to go, you would either have to you'd have to deny this application or ask them to withdraw it so that they don't have have to proceed um, until they can figure out what's going on with this. But that's certainly up to the applicant. You can vote it one way or the other, however you wish. If you want us to study this, we're happy to study it. Um, we can make it as much of a priority as it is a priority for you. Um, one of our challenges has always been our interstate interchanges, except for uh, the Bent Creek interchange have not by and large had all tracks in the city limits and that's been very challenging and that's why some of them are developed the way that they are um, but for the tracks that we do have um, it is nice to give them the flexibility to build what they need to build without a conditional use um, and also it's not the preference of staff to see housing and not that any housing is being proposed as part of this zoning change but it is a by right situation with this property and as the zoning sits today the limited development district allows housing on this so that nothing keeps the applicant from saying and not that they propose this well we want to build housing now they could they could do that by right they've got vested rights and this has been zoned ldd for some time i believe mr foot yeah it hasn't changed recently That's yeah correct so i think somebody's owned it that way because they wanted to do something there years ago so um i know it's a a tough situation but it's up, up to you if you want to pause and study this, um, then, then you can, but you've got to deal with the application before you one way or the other. If we deny it, it has to be a year, doesn't it, if we can move? Mr. Foote. Yeah, I believe that's correct. I was just thinking through that in my mind. I don't remember the section of the code, but if they would withdraw it, then they would have the ability to bring it back mm -hmm. quicker. Anytime than they wish. Yeah, I would say after we would study Yeah, the ex extenuating circumstance can allow it to be heard sooner, and I mean, there that, that would ultimately be up to the Planning Commission. Um, but an extenuating circumstance would be if you did deny this application and they came back and applied for anything. They wouldn't have to apply. We would automatically place the zoning on it if that's a designation you want to go with. They wouldn't have to apply for that, but they would for CDD. So it's ultimately up to them. Um, you heard some things in the in the early part of the meeting about, you know, you've got contractual deadlines and other things. You've got some folks that need some answers. So um, you're also at your pleasure. You can speak to them if you wish. 
meaning the council has the right to, if you want the applicant to approach again, you, you can ask them questions if you wish. I would like to ask him a question. Sure. Yeah, like I said earlier, I do appreciate your uh, interest in Auburn and, and want to develop out there. Uh, but would you, how would you feel about it if we would you like to withdraw your application tonight and and give us this council time to get some information from the city manager, and then you could re uh, put your plans back out there once we decided which way we want to go with this, rather than yeah. If I if I'm gonna get a negative vote, yes, I'd rather. Uh, Withdraw. Well, I can't speak for the rest of the council, but personally, I, 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 at this point, I got to vote uh, no. Mr. Mackey, if yes. you have a um, closing date, are you comfortable? Is it contingent upon this rezoning to a CDD, or is it um, one that you could still close on it, knowing that an interstate commercial designation may be forthcoming? If well, I'd have to talk with the, the landowner who owns it. Uh, you know, um, I mean, the interstate commercial would be fine with us uh, if, if we happen to have that tonight, but we don't. Right. So the uh, CDD is what, you know, we were told is what we would need for most commercial stuff there. Uh, I mean, we're not interested in housing and, uh, or anything like that. So that's why we were here. What was your um, anticipated timeline for moving forward with any type of development, if you're able to share that? Well, I, I don't have an end user yet. Okay. Uh, we kind of uh, we were thinking car wash to start with. That's off the uh, table. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for a hotel and maybe a, a, a restaurant. Okay. Th those kind of end users. And then we would, uh, with a conditional use, we would come back and ask for your permission. Mr. Mackey, in the, the the way that the car wash has kind of become not a thing, was that through a conversation with our planning department? Was yes, that partly there. Council and you listening to the council of the planning yes. department? Yes. I would say for Mr. Mackey, absolutely in terms of recommending zones, of, of the zones that we have available, CDD is it. You know, meaning there isn't another zone that's applicable here other than if we create a new zone. The South College Corridor District has very similar characteristics, but you don't typically, it's not applied in this area. So we'd either have to make that district here, which would be on the wrong road. You know, he, he is stuck in terms of legally stuck. He either gets the CDD zone or or the council and planning commission would need to take an action to create the interstate commercial zone so he can do very similar then he activities. misses his closing date our challenge is restricting a base zone so you can restrict a planned development district the size of his parcel he's not eligible for one mm -hmm. so he's a little bit stuck in the zoning ordinance in terms of because through a planned development district we could have ousted all the residential uses and it and it would have been the same um, we're currently working toward undertaking a study to get that those things addressed for this very situation um, but this is where it's a little bit of a cyclical challenge for you and it's what what do you want to do i'm very conflicted right now i respect the fact that you want you've spent money in our town and you want to spend more money in our town and you want to develop and i appreciate that and we're very grateful for that at the same time i agree with chief dawson we don't want to make maybe the same mistakes that were made earlier and we want things to be um, a little more presentable as people come into Auburn, especially sure. from the South. Um, if you want, I mean, I will double check. A, I know Mr. Foote has been in contact with the city attorney, and I am not under the impression that, that he interprets that we can condition the CDD zone. I did talk to the city attorney, and he does not uh, endorse that practice. Correct. So that and we've been asked that over the years. So that that's where it puts him. But if if you want to postpone, I mean, it's up to the applicant and in, in his time period to see if I can give you any other information for the next meeting, and we can talk with him in between. Um, that that's up to you. We, the, the applicant's been working with us. That's not it. I think you're just stuck between the land use plan and the CDD zone and, and his timing. Um, and he's absolutely been meeting and working with us. There is no. So we still have the option of postponing to a date certain where the applicant would not be required at this time to withdraw his his application. Correct. But in the course of that time and a date certain, should the applicant learn that um, additional information could make a request 
between that meeting, this meeting and that meeting to withdraw his application. Mm -hmm. He sure can. The question is the January 3rd meeting comes very quickly. Correct. I mean that we won't be working. Staff will be working. We have a few days off around the holidays, but I just mean, and we can, uh, there's enough people in town, we can certainly have some dialogue, but I just mean that's up to you and the applicant what you wish to do. But we could postpone to an even further date. You could. If but he's got a clock ticking on him. Did you say yes. January? Then yes, end of January. The end of end January. Of January. So. so the 17th. Is there another... Seventeenth uh, would work. Mm -hmm. Is that workable for you? Yes. And that's up to you. It gives us a little more time to vet everything that we okay. can and see if there's any stone we can um, turn over. If you have a general consensus about a commercial use, but that is that is why we need an interstate commercial zone because then there is no question about to to, to Chief Dawson's point. So let us see what we can do between now and then to see if we can provide any additional information. I'll try to get you a memo in the interim updated along the way. But the applicants have been working with us the whole time. Thank you for your spirit Thank cooperation. You. We Thank appreciate you. it. See you on the 17th. So potentially what we're looking at now is, is a motion to postpone. Right. right. And we've got our marching orders just to, to check legally if there's any other restriction or if he can agree to anything along those lines or any, any other tool in the toolbox. We'll, we'll try to do that. You're, I'm understanding from you collectively you're interested in interstate style uses in this vicinity. Yeah, not everybody on the council has spoken up. If there's anybody else who'd like to say anything. I certainly yeah, would like to see a study of the interstate commercial okay. uses. Okay. Let me see what we can do with this applicant stuck in the middle, and we'll we'll go from there. Okay, so procedurally, are we in order? You need to need... move to postpone if that's what you wish to do. Make a motion to postpone to January 17th. Second. All right, we have a motion to second postponed to January 17th. Do we need to do a roll call since this is the ordinance, or do we? You don't have to, no, because okay. you're not adopting right. an ordinance So yet. we'll do a vote, voice vote. All Absolutely. in favor? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank everybody for your patience. Appreciate y'all for your patience. All right, item 9C declares 9.78 acres of property located at Indian Pines Golf Course, which is jointly owned by the cities of Auburn and Opelika, as surplus property and authorizes the sale of such property to Auburn University to facilitate the expansion of the runway safety area for the Auburn University Regional Airport. Unanimous consent is necessary. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. I have a motion to second. Does anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with the vote on this this evening? Seeing a hearing none, is there any discussion or questions? Okay, Lindsay with the roll call. Norman? Yes, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Witten? Yes. Adams? Yes. Oblant? Yes. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Griswold? Yes, ma'am. Anders? Yes. Under resolutions, item 10A is a request from Kurt Haley of Haley Management Company for conditional use approval of a performance residential use at duplex for property located at 861 East Magnolia Avenue. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its December 8th meeting. A public hearing is required. Move for, for approval. Second. All right, I have a motion to second. At this time, we'll open the public hearing. If you'd like to address the City Council, please come forward and give us your name and address for the record. See no one. We'll close the public hearing. Any questions from the council? I have a couple. Please. <clears throat> what is the shape of Mr. Haley's lot? Is it rectangular or T-shaped? Yeah, Mr. Foot. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are three lots there. The one question is the one that is T-shaped. Okay. Is where they're proposing for the duplex. Right. So who owns the adjacent lots that Mr. Haley will use in resubdividing? Uh, the subject lot. I believe he owns all three of those lots. Okay, so there's no issue there whatsoever as far as being able to do that. The subdivision? No, as far as being able to come. <clears throat> what we're making a contingency on is 75 feet in width. So he can do whatever he wants to. He has a rectangle there, I guess. Yes, sir. And we've provided a, a drawing in your right. packet that shows that there is sufficient width along that frontage to resubdivide the property right. to provide the 75 feet that's required for the duplex lot. Right. And the only question I had is who owned who owned on either side of that 60 feet, I guess, is what he has in the T-shape. Right. It's okay. insufficient today. All right. And um, that is the point in issue. That's what's contingent is that 70, the 60 feet that currently exist in the front there. And so he's going to add enough 12 I can't do the math but 12 and a half feet yes sir a duplex oh. in the DDH requires a conditional use uh, initially they talked about getting a variance for that 
lack of 75 feet, yeah. we told them that would not be a, an appropriate way to go forward. That if they had the proper frontage, a resubdivision to achieve the correct width would be the proper way to go. That's a lot width at the street. Yes. Six. Just a requirement in the zoning ordinance. So he's got to comply with it. So if you were to approve this tonight and they <clears throat> cannot comply with it, it's moot. Okay. But we're not voting on a on that aspect. We're only voting on the use. It's just to show you they have the width to make it work. Okay. And there is a condition that was recommended by the Planning Commission that requires them to reset the Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the um, packet indicates that the number of parking stalls have not yet been provided. Is there any indication that there's going to be a problem with that? I think it's one per bid is required. Is that going to be sufficient? What, what they would have to rooms? provide that at DRT, and so that would be something when we get into the details the of detail, that nature. All right, that at would the be DRT. later on. All right, got you. So they are aware that yeah. they would have to do that. They all have right. to comply, or again, they can't get a permit. That's correct. So that's... Anyone else? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Item 10B authorizes a tax abatement for ADS Tech Energy Incorporated to be located at 229 Teague Court in the Auburn Industrial Park. The company will invest approximately $8,095,000 <coughs> and create approximately, it said, 177 in your packet, and they have adjusted that up to 180 jobs over the next two years. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion to second. Any comments or questions from the council? Certainly, congratulations to our staff. What a great, great addition to our community. I'm very proud to have this high tech company from Germany come to our community. Great press release out today. I had a quote from the governor included in there. Um, this is a big deal for Auburn. So, congratulations to our staff, everything that was done to make this happen. Very excited about this. Anything else? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 10C authorizes the transfer of funds identified in the fiscal year 2023 capital improvement plan for the industrial for industrial property to the Industrial Development Board of the City of Auburn for the purchase of approximately 78 acres of additional property located at 2477 Lee Road 10. The amount of the transfer would be $2,118,374. Move for approval. Second. Have a motion to second. Any comments or questions? Yes, uh, this will uh, allow 881000 of the uh, initial $3 million to remain. Do you have a proposed use for that in the future or is something coming along? Yes, we've been identifying property as part of an overall plan for the last several years. Microphone, microphone. Oh, okay. Sorry. And <clears throat> we've been identifying property over the last several years, so when working in this area, uh, this is just one of the first purchases we anticipate looking at other property and very shortly and so those funds would go towards the total purchase okay and will those be sufficient funds uh in your initial yes. assessment yes you uh, have okay. 2.5 million is in fiscal year 24 so yeah. we just split okay. we split okay. the stack up and so some of it could carry forward into 24 from this the remnant dollar amount you mentioned mr griswold and so that that will help do this there's other property identified but they're just not quite ready to That's proceed right. with okay. thank you thank you Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Item 10D authorizes the execution of a lease agreement with Auburn University for temporary use of, since you declared property surplus for Indian Pines, we call it former Indian Pines course property, <laughs> to facilitate the reconstruction of six holes at the golf course and the expansion of the runway safety area for the Auburn University Regional Airport. Move for approval. Second. second. I have a motion and second. Any comments or questions from council? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Those are all the items of business we have for you this evening. Okay. This time is opportunity for citizens' open forums. Your opportunity to speak to the council about anything on your mind. Uh, please give your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes to speak. Good evening, uh, Council Mayor. Um, I'm Robert Wilkins, uh, 261 Denson Drive. Uh, I was actually at my house with my wife, and I turned on the TV by accident, and uh, <coughs> I, I knew y'all were uh, talking about the uh, 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 revoking of business license uh, situation. And um, I was very impressed with most of you asking a lot of great questions in general. Um, but I want to know why everything stands as it is. We started this in October. 
we've discussed stuff, but the city continues to just say the same thing over and over. They don't change anything. Uh, this ordinance will not be the same as all 93 in the cross of the uh, state of Alabama. They're all different. A lot of them are very, very specific. Why can we not be specific? Why are we being so general? And um, <clears throat> uh, Councilman Parson, great what you said. Heavy-handed, yes. Y'all can, mm -hmm. can be heavy-handed, but other, other councils down the road. Because when you go to court, you can do anything you want because the law is the law. It's so broad, so open. Um, Councilman Taylor, uh, is it more than taxes? Yes. Bet your bottom it is. 100% more. You can do anything, not just taxes. If you want taxes, grab taxes. Put it in there. If there's something else, put it in there. Be specific. Do not be so general. It seems like when the city doesn't want something to pass the way they want it to pass, that they have a tendency to um, uh, be very general. The data, kind of like uh, something I have mentioned many a times before, you didn't bring up data. Barely, it was pulled out of y'all. 7,100 businesses, I believe you mentioned that uh, in the um, uh, meeting earlier. And uh, you talked about maybe 10, 13 businesses over the last 10 years. Uh, that's not many businesses out of 7,100. And um, if, but if you want to be specific, let's be specific. Let's quit being so general. It scares the hell out of me that you would have a law that would be so broad that would cover so much stuff. The questions y'all ask are great. Be more specific. But we've pulled this off for three or four months, the city hoping that we would not uh, continue on and y'all would give in. Please don't give in. Please. Vote the way you should vote for each one of your wards. Sonny, you're my ward person. Please vote uh, no. Or if it's specific, let the city come up with something. They didn't come up with anything. And um, anyway, that's it. Who'll be next? Mayor Anders, ladies and gentlemen of the council, Herbert Walter DeMar Jr., 412 Opelika Road, apartment 111. When I came before y'all at the last council meeting, I expressed my concerns on, in relation to the tasering incident in November, late November, and I still have those concerns. However, something has come to my attention since the last council meeting, and there is another situation that I was involved in last Sunday, and because of that, I would like to offer something from the front end tonight. Um, I would suggest something, some priority during 2023 in reference to mental health, since the gentleman that was the victim of the taser incident supposedly had mental health issues. If you could work with, say, Auburn University or East Alabama Medical Center and the Lee Council of Governments and the City of Opelika and the Lee County Commission to come up with some mental health facility or mental health unit. Uh, maybe you can add it to the public training center annexation that you approved tonight. And maybe, you know, make an amendment to the city budget or adjust it somehow to let this be so. Another suggestion to add to it, if you could work, or if you can convince the Lee County delegation to the Alabama legislature particularly the new senator that you all know him, Jay Hovey, to sort of make this a priority and try to get funding from the state with that. That would, I think that would help resolve the issue from the front end. Um, last Sunday, I ran into a gentleman who I know sort of somewhat, I think he has mental health issues. I hope I'm wrong, but he was sitting at a park bench at the, uh, in front of Hamilton's, he was just staring in the space. It's not coming out of his nose. So I had to run over to St. Dunstan's to get some paper towels and wipe off his side out of his nose and then give him the rest of the paper and one of my masks. And, you know, he was just sitting there at the park bench. And I'm sure there are other people like this. Now, when I checked back after church, I found he wasn't sitting there. And I hope he's all right. 
and other people like that are all right. So if you could sort of make this a priority for 2023, I think it can help resolve the public safety issue and the public health issue here in Auburn. And I would hope that the state and the country would also, you know, address this too. Just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Crouch, East Alabama Health is there to serve Auburn and Opelika. Uh, I know we appoint uh, a representative from our city to be serve on that board. Um, I presume they're the conduit for some of these types of things. I don't have a, a lot of knowledge of that. I don't know if our public safety director wants to speak a little bit just from the overall perspective. If we're referring to mental health assistance. Yeah, on East uh, Alabama Health and kind of how all that works. Correct. Uh, mental health, sorry, not health. Yes. Issues. Yes, we uh, public safety personnel are regularly in communication with uh, East Alabama Health uh, when they run across someone, as well as several other agencies uh, that deal with situations like this. So staff are trained to do that. And so, yes, that is our resource when staff run across someone who seems to be experiencing some difficulties and puts them in touch. And, you know, the difficulty in that is, is there has to be a justification at that point. What happens with that person? You know, are they a danger to themselves or someone else? So there, there's a lot of work to be done uh, nationwide about what we do about mental health. So it's, it's a difficult situation for everybody. Okay. Good. Well, that's not to say that there's not more to be considered and more to be thought through and more to be planned for. Uh, I just wanted to make sure our gentleman understood that there was some resource in our community that was active now and um, has been there for a while. So, all right, anyone else? Okay. This is our last meeting for this year. Hope everybody has a Merry Christmas again and a Happy New Year. Thank you for your patience. Is there a move to adjourn? So moved. All right, we adjourn. Thank you.